Uh, Dr. Dagmar Reinhardt teaches architectural design at the School of Architecture, Design and Planning, University of Sydney, uh, research in physical environment, playgrounds and everything. Also making uh, objects in museums, et cetera, accessible. And we've had some examples out there today you may have touched. Um, if you didn't, reach out to her at the end of this. Carolyn Bates from Guide Dogs, a certified orientation mobility specialist. It's been uh, employed by Guide Dogs for 21 years. She specializes in developmental O&M and also uh, teaches my own daughter. So I've got a certain bias. Uh, Natalie came from Vision Australia as a pediatric occupational therapist and a senior practitioner for children uh, and young people with uh, Vision Australia based in Sydney. And I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. So go for it. And thank you for that sports um, conversation. That was amazing as well. So I have titled this presentation, When I Grow Up, I Want to Be a dot, 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 Promoting Career Education in Children with Blindness and Low Vision. So maybe you're thinking careers, but what she's talking about, my child is four, seven, 10. They're far too young. Young Careers, employment, that's years away. I don't need to worry yet. Um, they're too young to be working. And yeah, that's right. It's actually illegal at that age to be going out and getting paid for work. But I'm actually not talking about that. I'm talking about all the stuff that happens before that. So as you heard, I'm a pediatric occupational therapist. Uh, that wasn't my first career choice. Uh, when I was four, I wanted to be a nurse. And that was because I was in hospital and I saw the nurses and they were wearing pink. And I like pink, pink's my favorite color, it still is. I thought I wanna do that job. So that's my earliest recollection of thinking about what I wanted to do or what I wanted to be when I grew up. And that's kind of what this topic is about. It's thinking and getting ready for the future. Because if we don't start preparing now or whatever age or stage that we're at, then the future is suddenly upon us and we're trying to play catch up. So when I'm talking about career education and the vision teachers in the room would know, know this as well, for children and young people, certainly academic learning is a, a major important part of that. But experience and research has shown me that it's not the only part. Uh, it's really valuable to consider how we build all of their skills and especially their vision specific skills so they can prepare as best they can for adulthood. We want participation and occupation being meaningfully occupied as a long-term goal for all of our, our clients and families that we work with. And I guess this future-focused employability approach, this is the lens through which I've been doing my practice for a number of years now. It's the, the topic for my PhD, which is on career education for children with blindness and low vision, building positive beliefs and aspirations about what's possible for the future. Now I have a few slides that I'm going to show and I'll, I'll explain what's on them. There's a, a photo of a, a little person or a child on each of these slides and they're participating in some form of career education. But in actuality, it looks like they're playing. And I guess that's the message that I wanted to share today. How can we utilize everyday opportunities to build concepts and skills for future occupation and participation? Play being a major part of that. Where am I aiming? Oh. Yep, it is. Hi, please. <laughs> what can you do next? All right, cool. So, an important principle that's underlying what I'm talking about is incidental visual learning. And this can be defined as the knowledge and skills that we get through casual observation of the world around us. So, from infancy, children with full vision can be watching and learning about their world. And, um, and learning about it before they even engage in that activity. And they just through that observation, they can understand concepts about tasks, about roles, what's going on around them. And this learning can occur serendipitously, accidentally, incidentally, 
possibly without any intervention from an, from an adult or a grown up in their world. So for me, with the nurses in pink, they were influencing my, the, my early career aspirations because I could see it. No one told me, I saw it happening. So why is this a big deal for the, the children and young people who have blindness and low vision? Well, they can also learn about all of these concepts around the, about the world around them, as long as we help bring it to them. If we don't, then there is a risk for some gaps in their um, conceptual understanding of the world around them. And that's across all aspects of life, independent skills, social and communication, play, friendships, general knowledge, geography, work. I'm always wondering in my practice, how has blindness or low vision potentially impacted the learning here? And how am I going to mitigate that so my client can still learn? So on the screen at the moment is a photo of me with a little person with blindness, and we are shopping in a make-believe supermarket in an indoor play centre at Chatswood here in Sydney. He's pushing a small shopping trolley, and in the background are shelves of pretend fruit. As part of our game, we had explored each shelf and every item and he decided no fruit and veg weren't for him. He wanted to buy fish and we're on our way to the, the shopping trolley, oh, sorry, to the cash register to make our purchase. Next slide, please. <laughs> All right, so let's jump into some concepts of career education. And for the vision teachers in the world in the room, this might be very familiar information, but I wanted to go over it anyway. Career education is one of the nine life skill areas of the expanded core curriculum or the ECC, which is essentially all the areas of learning specifically identified for children and young people with blindness and low vision, so they can prepare for adulthood. Now, Dr. Karen Wolf could be very familiar to a lot of you in this room. She developed something called the career education model, she wrote it down. It's a developmental continuum that starts in early childhood and it progresses all the way through into adulthood. And it's this idea that skills and knowledge is acquired in stages and each stage, what's learned in that one contributes to the next stage of learning. Interestingly for us, four of those stages in that model occur in childhood and adolescence. That's when they're, when they're starting awareness, exploration, preparation, and placement. And given our scope for today, for our panel today is the under 12s, I'm going to be going through the first two of those on that list, awareness and exploration. On the screen at the moment, I have a photo of a um, My Vision Australia lanyard. The reason for that, this is a strategy that I often use with kids when we have group activities going on. The, symbol of the, the symbolism that's associated or attached to having a lanyard so I've had kids as young as preschool coming along and doing group activities with us and we'll put a lanyard on them. This is a symbol of what people do when they go to go to work, they go to a, um, a workplace, they often have a, a lanyard and kids love having those there. So that's why that photo is there. Next one, please. Thank you. The first stage, awareness. Now this is something that's beginning in early infancy and continuing into early primary school. And as the name suggests, it's about building an awareness of what's happening around them, including jobs and people working, and beginning to understand that there's a difference between work and play, that they're, they're two different concepts. So on the screen is the photo of a little person dressed up like an explorer. He's got a khaki shirt and pants, a brown vest, a floppy hat, and he's got binoculars around his neck. This is the, the age and stage for make-believe play and dress-ups. And this is often when um, there's a lot of imitation of, of grown-ups in work roles happening. So some of the areas of learning in this particular stage, it's developing positive habits and behaviours. And this it might sound strange, but this is the, the age and stage where it's almost that early development of, of what could be called a work ethic, in inverted commas. So... Um, for this age group, it could be learning to cooperate with others, taking care of your belongings, putting your toys away. Next on the list is developing transferable skills. So this is doing activities at home, at preschool or a school that are helping to build basic work skills that can take them forward into the future for all aspects of life and learning. So think organisation, understanding where things go. The cutlery drawer is an excellent opportunity to practice some of these things. Developing social awareness. So being aware of others, 
knowing what's expected of you in different settings by different people. And this is an awareness that helps to build social skills and imagining what they might wanna be when they grow up. And it's not on there, but the other thing that I think about is having responsibilities at home. So chores, setting the table, emptying the cutlery from the dishwasher, having responsibilities, even in this young age, that helps to build a sense of responsibility and a sense of capability. Our next slide is about career exploration. And as this name says, it's exploring. This stage is about discovery, usually from mid to late primary school and into early high school. It's exploring jobs that your child or your student might like. So maybe they already have a list of ideas of jobs that they, they um, think sound interesting. This is the stage to literally go out and find out more information about it. One strategy for that is understanding clusters of jobs. So some jobs we can, we can group together, either they have a similar skill set or they might be done in the same location. And sometimes you can use that as a way to explore options um, for a child or a young person. So say your child or your student loves aeroplanes. Not everyone can be a pilot. However, if we think of the airport industry, the travel industry, there are so many jobs that are occurring there. That's a way to come up with a topic of things to, to talk about and explore. Next on that list, understanding values, interests, skills, and abilities. And there are some things like having the right skills, so technology skills, that's something across all, um, all kind of employment or occupation um, locations. But encouraging your child to, to think about their abilities, their interests, their values, and how those might match up with particular jobs or occupations, that's a really beneficial activity to do. And it's also a strategy for building self-determination and self-advocacy skills as well. Refining positive workplace habits across different settings, that means they practice. So it's not only something they do at school, they also do it at home and vice versa or in the community. And the final thing on that list are time management and money management, which of course are relevant for work, but they're also really relevant for all these years of learning between now and that time they go for work. On the screen at the moment is a photo of a, a young girl who's probably familiar to a few of you in the room. She is in the radio studio with me at our office in uh, Kuyong. We have some recording and radio studios. At this time, one of her areas of interest was voice acting. So we'd gone in there to have an opportunity of exploring what would be involved if you did that kind of job. And my last slide is... I wanted to finish by giving you a list of my favorite activities to do around career education, which hopefully sound like they are in, uh, doable within everyday routines. And there's a photo on the screen of a young child. She's dressed up in surgical scrubs and she's looking at a photo of herself on an iPad. And this was from the family day that um, Vision Australia did at Kuyong in Melbourne a couple of weeks ago. And they set up a, a future me dress up booth. So the kids were dressing up and going in and having their photo um, taken um, that they could take home as well. So my favorite things to do are having lots of here and now and future conversations. And by this, I mean connecting the things that, we're, that are happening in the here and now, always with the future and quite deliberately and sometimes explicitly. So for example, if I see a group of children who are collaborating really well together, I might make a comment like, I like how you're playing together so, so nicely. That's such great teamwork. Your future boss is going to be so happy that you can play so well with other people because that's what you'll do when you go to work. I love any opportunity for dress-ups and make-believe play. Uh, and for this to be accessible for kids with blindness or low vision, it's just using lots of descriptive language and not just about what they're wearing, but maybe what also the accessories are, that what they're for where this job might take place and what the tasks might be. So with our little person who's wearing her scrubs here, I might say, well, Jessica is wearing a green top and long green pants, and she's wearing a special hat on her head. They're all called scrubs, and that's her uniform. She works in a hospital and she does operations on people to make them feel better. There's lots of jobs in hospitals. Let's go find out what some their, um, other jobs might be we can learn about. Storybooks are a great source of information for, uh, or a great tool for exploring jobs. Uh, as part of my PhD research, I'm using storybooks about jobs. And when I was doing research for that, 
I searched on Amazon and there were something like 30,000 different job uh, book titles about jobs for children under 12. And that started with really simple ABC kind of books all the way through to reference books. There's a lot of literature out there can be accessed to use for, for telling stories about working. Community commentary is what it sounds like. It's picking a spot in the community and sitting and talking about what are all the jobs that you can see there? So shopping centres, hospitals, the airport is, is a great one, libraries, sports stadiums. I had someone do this at a wedding once. There are so many jobs that are happening in wedding venues and they, he, that child was then able to list 10 different jobs they learned about from the wedding on that weekend. The alphabet game, that's a really good car game. It's just thinking of a job that starts with a letter of the alphabet A to Z. You can do it if you think it through. And the final thing on there I have is a statement, let's find out. And I guess that's something that I try to encourage when I'm talking with kids and with families. I don't tend to say, oh no, you can't do that job because you have blindness or low vision. It's a, well, let's find out, let's explore it. Let's learn a little bit more about that job. And often the kids and young people make those decisions for themselves. So thank you. I'm gonna hand over to Carolyn, but thank you. And I hope that's, I guess, raised a little bit more awareness of, of what are options for supporting a child or a student's career education. Thank you. That should be green. Hello. And thank you, Natalie. That was wonderful and comprehensive. Always a hard act to follow, um, particularly after lunch in a little bit of a warm environment. So I'll do what I can to keep everyone awake. Okay, so good slides up. Thank you. I'll just, oh, I'm going to say next. Okay. So I might stay seated if you don't mind. Usually I do like to get up and, and walk around, but just so I've got easy access to my slides. So thank you. So I'd like to start with a quick overview of O&M. And I've included on this slide an image of a cane, which of course is typically associated with our role. But as many of you know, orientation and mobility is more than simply mobility aid instruction. So I will be talking more about that in my next 10 minutes. Okay. Oh, all right. We'll give it, give it a whirl. Okay. Um, so really, I'd just like to provide a quick overview of O&M. Um, I know for many of you, it is an area of great familiarity. Um, for others, it might be an introduction. Yeah. Um, I'd really like to, though, reflect on the role that o &M plays in supporting these successful outcomes for students with low vision, um, particularly when we are looking at developing those independent skills. Um, so just let me try this clicker, fingers crossed. Not yet. All right, I'll try again. How about, no. No. Am I pressing the wrong button? Operator error? Oh, okay. Those two. What? No, there we go. Hooray. All right. So, thank you. All right. So, as an introduction, what is O&M? O&M is a profession. And I can assure you, it is a full-time profession. Um, O and M, the OMAA, and I have a picture of the logo on the slide here. The OMAA is our professional body for O and M specialists, which covers Australasia and also the South Pacific region. We are a very small profession, however. Within that organisation, there are about 120 of us who are O and Ms, and of that, 70 of us are certified and registered with the professional body. Okay. Now, our certification process is aligned with the certification process in the US. And the reason for this is that we simply do not have the numbers in order to support that certification in Australia, whereas in the US, which is really where the profession developed and where we get a lot of our professional development, they do have the numbers, so we are aligned with that system. But for registration, we do that with our local professional body, which is the OMAA. Um, if you're not a member of the OMAA, I would suggest that you have a look. Uh, you can be affiliate members, and it does give you access to O&M specialists and information around that. 
Typically, O&M is a postgraduate qualification. Yeah? Uh, we typically have a background in either education or allied health. We love it when we can recruit teachers and OTs and physiotherapists. Um, it's a graduate diploma that is currently the certified course, the accredited course in Australia. And that's the graduate diploma, which is now run through UNSW. Okay. And what we're finding is increasingly within the O&M profession, because we've started to be around for this long, we're starting to specialise. So for myself, my specialisation is in early childhood. The youngest client I have had is two months, and the parent got in contact when she was pregnant because she knew we were going to need our services going forward. Yeah. And there's also specialization in areas for access and technology, uh, for neurological vision impairment, and increasingly uh, for children who have additional needs as well as vision impairment. Okay, still no? That one? No. Still trying the big one? No. There we go. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So as well as a profession, the words orientation mobility also denote the body of knowledge. Yeah. So it's, oh, sorry, it's getting a little bit caught up there. So orientation mobility refers to the skills and techniques required for independent travel by those who are blind or have low vision. So the orientation is the cognitive component of travel. So the orientation part is knowing where you are, where you want to go, and how you're going to get there. So the mobility, that's the physical component of the travel. So that's being able to move safely, efficiently, and with confidence from one point to another. Okay. But orientation and mobility covers a lot of domains. So it's typically described in terms of five domains and you'll notice there's a fair bit of overlap so collaboration is key so some of the concept development that Natalie was referring to we would also be looking to support um, with our students so typically motor skill development is a really important component of o &M, and that's why that presentation by Jason I found that absolutely joyous so historically we have also worked to provide to make sure that students with vision loss are included in PE and sport in schools. Um, and it's wonderful to know that we can now involve Jason's organisation with that as well. So for motor skill development, it's not just looking at muscle strength, it's looking at balance, gait, posture, the foundations of movement. We look at sensory skill development as well. So this is attending to and interpreting sensory input. So it might be the use of the vision that is available to the child. It's certainly auditory input, tactile, and also proprioceptive and kinesthetic. So understanding where the body is in space. How does it feel in your ankles when you're walking up a hill or down a hill? All of these sensory inputs that might not be um, immediately apparent. But concept development, this is the big one. And this is where we draw on really heavily collaborative practice with everyone involved around the child. So there's body concepts, body image and awareness, um, spatial concepts, and you're including laterality, directional, positional concepts, and environmental concepts, time and distance, units of measurement. But we also have involvement in, I will get this coordinated, social skills. And again, we might also be involved in that sort of career education. So helping students understand how people in societies live and work together. Yeah. Um, and then with all of that, you've got what you might consider those formal O&M skills. So these are things like guide technique, alignment and protective techniques, public transport, route planning, and use of mobility aids. And again, a mobility aid might be a guide dog, certainly not in the under 12s, but certainly long cane, ID cane, or they may not use a cane. They might use another type of adaptive mobility device. 
um, electronic devices as well. But again, the point that we would make is that orientation and mobility is curricular. You don't learn it all at the age of five and then you're set for life. The skill sets change as you progress. Okay, so I'm actually quite excited about this tool that was presented at the International O&M Symposium last year. And this is actually, I think, a resource in looking at where do we start? This is something the parents often know. What does a child need at a particular age? Yeah. So the standards are the orientation and mobility career, college, that's the American reference, and community readiness standards. So this was developed by a US-based researcher called Mary Tellefson. She is a comms. She is also a teacher of the vision impaired, and she has a master's in education as well. And what the ONMCCR standards do is they identify those principal ONM skill areas, which pretty much map to those domains that I mentioned before. And these are the skill areas that have been, I guess, denoted as being necessary for independent, safe and efficient travel for college, career and effectively life beyond school. Yeah. So listed there again, concept development, sensory development, uh, orientation and mapping, formal and travel techniques, and communication, personal safety, and advocacy. So what this, what these standards do is that they align these skills across age and grade appropriate stages. So starting at the age of two and going up to the age of 18. And this has been pulled together from various assessment tools that we use in orientation and mobility, but it's really thinking about assessment as a process. In the same way that we have other educational standards, this is where we can look at a domain like sensory development and say, okay, by grade seven, this is what these are the performance indicators. These are the standards that we would be looking at this child to acquire. Yeah. So I will be talking more about these standards in my breakout session after if you're interested. Okay. Orientation mobility, as we know, is part of the expanded core curriculum. And this is where you might also see those areas of overlap, particularly with sensory efficiency, if we're doing things like echolocation. Um, looking at self-determination, again, being, you know, developing that self-efficacy around independent travel. It's a really good way to do it. And social interactions. Again, how is a child interacting with public when they're traveling? How are they managing sometimes those unwelcome attentions? How can they effectively solicit or refuse assistance in those situations? Okay, so we do have an updated PE resource as well, given our history and, and looking to support this for students in school. Um, this is also designed for parents as well as teachers. And we do have a link and I think a printed handout. And I'm really interested in discussing this further with Jason, how we can align these more in the future. Okay. I would encourage you, if you haven't had any access to this book, Partners in O&M. This is a textbook that I think should really just inform curriculum everywhere. It is designed for people who are supporting O&M and collaborating with orientation and mobility specialists. And it's also a really good resource for parents. If you want to find out more about orientation mobility and do a deep dive and be able to really inform those conversations around the IEP, this is a really good resource in order to do that. Okay. So that's really, I'll leave that there and yes, maybe see you in the breakout room. Thanks. Had a document. Yes, that was a document. So stages and I emailed it to myself, so I'll forward it to everyone else. That's you. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. And um, now, if you want to get up and just turn a bit and then sit down again, now is the time to do that.
Because I know it's get, getting really hot in here, so a bit of movement is probably good. Yeah, yeah. We just see air conditioning. Possibly. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> and not being able to open the windows, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm also totally okay for people to stay standing up or to walk around if you want to. That's perfectly um, fine for me. Um, so 10 minute uh, thing is a bit of a spiel. Um, my background is um, architecture. I'm a practicing architect. I'm teaching um, architecture design studios. And uh, my father is 82 and six years ago, it was clear that he was going to turn blind. Um, I have been always trying to tie my research to things that are really very, very deeply um, and very close to my heart. Um, so somehow um, I started to deal a little bit more with, not only with the idea of perception or how we're moving through spaces, which I do as an architect um, anyway, um, but thinking about different capacities that we do have or different abilities that we do have um, as people who are planning for um, people with these other characteristics and different worlds and different experiences and perceptions. And um, so out of that background that started in 2019, we at the moment at the school, Sydney School of Architecture, we do have uh, um, 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 we do have two projects that we are running in different constellations. Uh, one is the Museum of Touch, which I wanted to um, present to you today. And the other one is the Playground for the Blind um, and Low Vision Children. We're just going to see if this is... Ah, okay, good. <laughs> that works. Um, so the Museum of Touch is coming out. Uh, and again, it's not something that I do alone, but uh, we're working uh, with uh, Monash um, Accessibility um, Institute, with Macquarie uh, Early Childhood um, Educators, particularly for the blind one. Um, but this one is also with the Chow Chuck Wing Museum. The Chow Chuck Wing Museum is, uh, um, is a museum of uh, Sydney um, uh, University. It houses uh, natural history, uh, Roman, the Greeks, uh, amphoras, uh, um, indigenous artifacts, uh, and a large uh, natural history um, collection. Museums are interesting, um, particularly for blind and low vision pe people, because they're actually not there. Um, because if you go to a museum and everything is behind glass and you can't touch it, it's not there, right? So it might be good for everyone else. Um, but if you go there, there's very little benefit that you do have, um, unless you have someone who's really gifted with the narratives um, and can explain everything to you that's there. Um, or you have an audio guide that might just, you know, sort of capture your purposes, but mostly not. Um, and so we started working with the object-based, um, sorry, that's now bringing us back. Um, next, <laughs> sorry for that, <laughs> too excited, obviously, yeah, um, but uh, um, they have two, um, two very fantastic people, um, Eve Gary and Jane Ferguson from the object-based learning um, um, section, um, and these two people, if on demand, if you um, contact them um, and make an appointment, they bring out 4,000-year-old stone axes. Um, in a seminar room and they give you gloves and then you can get to touch these very, very, very old artifacts, which was um, extremely fascinating to me when I first learned it. So that's the one thing we are working with them on the project. The other thing that's really interesting, and I think it started with COVID, is that we have started to scan museum collections. Um, so when everybody was secluded at home, we traveled the world through these digital collections that present artifacts which is a great way of looking at museums. So these ones, the, or the, our partners here at the Chow Chak Wing Museum have started to have a whole range of these digital, um, digital uh, illustrations or, or digital entities or you know, appearances um, of those. Um, but the fantastic thing is you have then these data. So the moment when these data are scanned, they, you can access them on the internet. Um, but you can also do other things with them. So uh, actually, sorry, I'm very bad at this. What we see here is um, hands touching um, these artifacts, uh, an image of the space at the Chow Chak Wing Museum and an excerpt of the collections that are existing um, on the internet as part of their presence. Next one. And now we have a mutiny, okay. <laughs> Some other museums are, um, have really fantastic possibilities for blind and low vision people. Uh, one of the things that I found while starting with this research, bless you, 
um, with this uh, research was the Mösga Museum in Denmark. Um, what you see here is a silver cauldron, 70 uh, centimeters wide, that depicts um, two warring tribes. Um, and it actually signifies the treaty that they made, uh, peacemaking um, equipment, so to speak, um, which is very finely carved um, um, inside and outside of that silver bowl. And what, what the museum did was they created a space of that. So you can literally move through, you put a helmet on and then you move through um, that space while touching some of those blown up uh, relief um, um, illustrations in there. Next one. The Frankfurt uh, Museum um, also has little coins. Um, so this is at the Frankfurt Historical Museum. What you see here is uh, an overview of different coins being collected in a glass vitrine. But on top of the glass vitrine is a 3D printed uh, coin excerpt, which has been uh, where the information has been um, a little bit uh, minimalized. You still see the bear and some lettering and, uh, and a year. Um, and that's an erased profile printed as a 3D model and can be touched. Next one. Yeah, so we do at the moment hold a small grant. I'm not going to go through all of that, but that small grant um, by the Alistair Swain Foundation will allow us to um, work with uh, blind and low vision audiences um, to look at some of the museum artifacts and to look at how we can best 3D print them and test them with people who are blind. Um, and have um, low vision. Um, we'll do that together with our partners from NextSense here in Australia, but also with the EBOS Institute for Blind and Partially Sighted in Denmark. So we do have two groups. Um, we are, what we are also trying to do is we are establishing a platform so that um, whoever has a 3D printer, uh, which might be interesting for educators, can download these files. Um, and print them off um, at your station. Um, you can either do that with a normal um, plastic print or you can do that with an SLA print. I'm very happy to talk to people later um, in regards to that as well. Um, and then we're trying to um, produce a workflow that allows us to scan more and scan stuff from our own environments and then to upload that as well. But the main point is really to um, give the museums a possibility to have an easy way to take parts of their collections, print them and exhibit them uh, in a very quick short manner in the museums. Next one. Um, okay, and so in order to test that, um, of course they wouldn't give me the their artifacts to scan as clear um, and for the test groups. So, um, and because we are focusing on natural history, um, what you see here is an abalone shell, a 3D printed one, and then a natural one next to it, and also the 3D data next one. Um, scanning is great because you can do it with your iPhone. There's scanning software um, so that you can take multiple shots um, by moving around the object um, uh, itself. Photogrammetry is a different uh, version that we use in order to collate uh, multiple images, and then the software combines um, all of them. Uh, the point is, again, as I said, if you have the 3D data, um, you can show it to your class, uh, which I also do, um, but you can also 3D print it. Next one. Um, and so then we have been doing a couple of tests. So this is a, a box fish uh, um, that someone found 1780, uh, which is now part of the uh, Chow Chak Wing Museum uh, collection. It's a mounted skin. Um, um, and so that's exhibited on the digital side. Um, what we try to do with that um, investigation here is to not only showcase the overall geometry, so it's boxy, but it also has this Voronoi pattern, which is this sort of hexagonal pattern over the skin. So we highlighted that by making that into a relief. Next one. Um, and then we also tested a couple of other things. So part of that um, investigation is how good is it and is the materiality okay and is the fine texture fine, uh, okay enough. Um, so this is a gum nut again on one side, the 3D data. Um, and then on the other side, the printed um, 3D model versus the gum nut itself. Um, so um, we are really trying to find out is the scale good? Um, how big does the scale need to be? What other references do we need if the printer bed, and some of you might be working with printing, uh, the printer bed is only 20 centimeters, the fish is bigger than that. So how do we do the um, comparison between the two of them? Next. Um, but the data also allows us to go really big. Um, so we have here the coastline of uh, Malabar. This is wrong here, Malabar scanned with a drone. 
Um, and we, we can also um, CNC mill that out, but also 3D print. I have the little 3D printing model, which is bless you that size um, also. Next one. Um, and so we've been um, running a first sort of pilot test series um, with 3D models. Um, we try to have good stories around them. So one story is about Darwin's finches, um, which develop their uh, beaks uh, depending on food sources. So this is part of uh, sort of the evolution. There's a story about um, fishes and fish teeth compared to human teeth. Um, so what you see here is sitting in the other room. If you want to come to my breakout session, you can sort of try. Uh, some of these bits and pieces. Next one. Uh, yeah, we've been testing that if uh, in terms of scale, um, truth of material, um, the good story or not. Um, some people don't like plants. Everybody liked the fishes. Next one. <laughs> Um, this is the 3D database, which will continue to grow, but that's already um, available on SketchUp. Um, so it's called Museum for Touch. Next one. Yeah, and just very briefly, this is the second project, which I'm not going to talk about, but we're also testing if um, playgrounds are actually good for blind and low vision people. And we know in Australia, they're actually not because no one knows what is on these playgrounds because we don't even have maps for them, which would be super easy, but we don't. So we're working on that. Um, next one. Um, and we're also not only working with raised maps, but uh, things that have little icons on there. And also we are very interested in developing some play tools that might be inclusive and really good for all. So next one. Um, so we're doing a couple of surveys in order to find out how good they are or what's good about them. This is a global study. Um, if you're interested in either the museums or having data for printouts, or if you're interested in the playgrounds, then please contact me and sorry for taking so long. Thank you. <laughs> That's fantastic. I think uh, I can quite confidently predict that everyone wants to get their hands on that now. So, that, so literally some of this, if we've got a 3D printer and the right software, go, we can do it now. Hey. We'll provide the link that survey if you're interested about on time. All right, so we're going to do a few questions and then we're going to move to the breakout sessions. Just so you understand what a breakout session means, there will be three breakout sessions. Carolyn will be running one from Guide Dogs aimed at parents, but it is open and inclusive. So it was kind of initially aimed at parents, but anyone, educators, it's the theme of early starts, talking about early stages of orientation, mobility, foundational skills, etc. So I can talk from experience. Uh, if you can't vision uh, what it's like what a six-month-old does with a cane and how you take the steps towards them being an independent cane, et cetera. That's the real world of orientation and mobility. So that's that's my lived experience. Uh, second, Professor, Professor Dagmar will be doing a workshop on touch workshop. So you get to touch the shells, the fish. Do we have the fish? The fish are there as well, et cetera. Birds, turtles, et cetera. Um, so you can get hands on and check out what's available. And Ada McCluskey, will, um, an opportunity for parents and educators to ask questions with Ada, a registered psychologist, about their experience with VI. But for now, let's get to the questions. Um, I've got quite a few here, um, if you're fine for me to dive in. Um, let's start with contact. If my child or student says they want to do a particular job, I want to be an astronaut. I got that yesterday, and I don't think it's going to be feasible because they they have blindness or low vision. What do I tell them? Should I say that's not going to be possible? Do I leave it? I think you touched on this at the beginning. It's Natalie. I'll um, I'll give some suggestions for that one. I guess it does depend a little bit on the the age and stage the the child or young person is at. So if they are a long way into their career education journey and maybe their ideas aren't super realistic and they're going to be finishing school in a couple of months' time, then there might be a good opportunity to have some real-life conversations about uh, that particular job role. But if, if this is a, a, a little person or a, a child or a early high school, then I guess that's the, the let's find out because I guess we don't know 
now what jobs and workplaces are going to be like in 10, 15 years time. We don't even know some of the jobs that are going to exist. So uh, rather than say, oh, no, you can't do that. Well, it's a let's find out what does that job involve? What would you need to do to get there? Do you actually like that job? Where do people do that job? By exploring that, then what, then what I have found is that the kids kind of decide, oh, yeah, I'm not going to do that anymore. I would much rather a child go through 10, 15 different kind of job ideas every 12 months than just get one and fixate on that for the whole time without knowing what that job actually is. So it does depend on the age and stage that they're at and where they are at in that career education continuum. Yep. Okay. NDIS had to come into this at some stage. So uh, here we go. Um, what's the best place for resources on who should support what? Education, health, NDIS, how do you justify reasonable and necessary supports? Anyone heard that before? Uh, with the NDIS. Now, I think many of us have been through this. Um, what's, what's the structure you put in place? What's the logic? What's... Uh... Oh. <laughs> this is a real world question, people. Yeah, okay, where to start with that one? Um, I guess I can really only speak from the O&M perspective. And I think the success well, in trying to get to success and looking at what is reasonable and what is necessary, um, pulling in as many tools as possible. So things maybe like these O&M standards. So these are the performance indicators. This is what we're looking at. You know, how are we going to support these children to keep up um, with their peers? What are their peers doing? What are children with low vision or blindness not doing? And how do we adjust that gap? Um, again, um, I'm going down the path of looking at service determination levels. Again, this is a model that we're looking at in, in the States, um, but this might have implications for, I guess, um, you know, supporting uh, funding for children here too. Um, I think, you know, that that's really quite broad, you know, where where are the resources? You know, again, just joining as many of, you know, again, your support groups as possible, um, talking to all the practitioners, the educators, everyone involved in your team. Um, yeah, that's, I think that's a, a really, you know, it's a really important question, but the one that we don't necessarily have all the answers to at the moment, it is an evolving practice. A really good example, the boundary between health, home and education is, is completely artificial in the world of O&M, really, as in it has to intertwine them all in a pretty much seamless way. You know, O&M occurs, as an example, occurs across contexts. So it's not just what happens at school, it's what happens at home, it's what happens in the community, it's how we embed it into that student's life. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's probably also worth saying that... Um, o and &M, you can have the same o and &M supporting you at home for home goals and at school for things that have to happen and have to work at school as well and even in the health context. So how you justify it sometimes means you need to play mind games in the way you write on the page, but the reality is they're not just pigeonholed into one sector. Uh, right. <laughs> sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry. It's Natalie. I'll just make one one comment. I guess that is, uh, it's not always easy, but uh, my experience has been that NDIS doesn't always understand the intricacies and um, impact of blindness or low vision across all aspects of life. So what I spend a lot of my time doing is trying to come up with really good descriptions and words for describing the impact of the right now and how this is impacting, going to impact in the future if we don't address it now. So when that reasonable and necessary thing, sometimes I am always giving families information about how can you explain your child's vision specific needs, what the implications are of doing nothing and what that's going to cost if we do nothing, if we can do it from a, um, a developmental achievement rather than a retrospective trying to fix it later bit, which will cost more, uh, that is one way to help explain the reasonable and necessary. The third one about objects, because in school and life, as you go through the developmental stages, which are very much surfaced 
through the schooling system, you kind of see the stages happening in a way that can slip away. There is often all these materials that get put up on the screen that are visual. Um, so Dagmar, I'm guessing at your end, when you started this process, you would have been surveying what is available and what isn't and how accessible these tactile objects are. Like, what did you find when you came in six years ago, having been stepping in from outside of the sector? Yeah, uh, not that long ago, actually. <laughs> six years would be good, but um, now I think, God, it's more. It's mostly more for like, how is it better for everybody? It's not really about you know. It's better for this. Group. So I think there's um, there's there's, if you're sighted, you're very stupid because you can do some things really not. In uh, in all my interactions, I've just learned it's a complete. It's it's uh, it's such a great way to perceive other edges of the world. Um, and I think it's um, the conversations that we had, they were absolutely stimulating and really, really beautiful. So what I'm trying to do is to bring people together and to bring these different facilities together and not to say, you know, specialize and then just works for that group, but really to say, okay, so how, how do we make it better for everybody or how, how do we, what's so interesting about that and can that relate to someone else? And, but the idea of touching, yeah, which is, which is so, um, which is so well defined in that, and also so it, there's such joy in touching, right? Um, I think that I think it's fantastic. It gives something back to what we have lost, because we're so visually oriented. My 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 eyes are bleeding every day by sitting eight hours in front of a computer, and I think this is some some way to take back the world, and to engage with the small things, and to be very sensitive about the fabric and the texture of the world that surrounds us. So that's really, I mean, that's part of the motivation really. And, and I suppose a question to all three of you, what is the barrier to entry to bring a tactile version of what is just being innately learned visually otherwise into the classroom or into, into life? So you can just say tacit and embodied knowledge. I think that's for everyone. If you haven't been there, you don't know. Like if you haven't, if you have not been in that world, if you haven't touched it, you don't know as part of it. And I think that we, I think we're too much in our, so this is a bit of a manifesto. I think we're too much in our brain. We're not enough in our bodies. And so learning, learning is touching something, being there, being fully engaged in all of your senses, with your tongue, with your ear, with your eye, with your hand, with everything. Opening outcomes. And from a <laughs> and from an O and M perspective, being able to have three D models and three D printing, and the way that that's supporting learning, you know, like printing out models of intersections, for example, all these really larger environmental concepts that are again so you know not immediately tactilely accessible. So again, yeah, it's very exciting to see the evolution of. Yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, just just on that one. So we do have uh, we see and see the surface of the moon with the Apollo uh, moon landing and the traveling like a braille setup of the um, astronaut traveling that. So and this is good for everyone because no one can be on the moon, right? So that's one way for us to inhabit that. But I think you're perfectly right with the sort of larger environments that can be taken. Good. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question because we are running late, and then we'll go into sessions. So. I think I should ask this one. It's always important. Advocacy in schools. So how do we encourage children to feel more confident when advocating their vision needs to others, to staff, to their peers, to their friends, to the members of the playground who aren't their friends? So I, I just had land in my inbox. Um, uh, you may have as well, Natalie. I'm sure, I'm in, I'm sure there's a Venn diagram. Yeah, um, so APH Connect, the Career Connect, um, they've just made available, again, it's a resource designed for TBIs or vision teachers and other rehab specialists. And it's actually based on the work done on the text from Sharon Sachs and Zellman um, and others. And it's actually a, a course in assertiveness training. And what I really liked about that, it was talking, addressing um, subjects like um, distinguishing between assertive, aggressive, and passive. 
and like talking around the roles around that. It talks about exuding body confidence. It talks about boundaries, how to say no and respecting yourself and others. So I think, yeah, that would be a great resource at a starting point.